Thank you, Dr. Flexel, and I want to thank the committee for very hard work to make these reviews really reliable and state of art. On behalf of the retinal panel of preferred practice pattern, I'll talk about posterior vitreous detachment. And I do not have any financial interest in the topic of this talk. As you all know, vitreous is transparent and clear. And for that reason, the anatomy of vitreous is not very well known. Just behind the lens capsule, we have Berger space, which Normally, cataract surgeons don't encounter it unless they break the posterior capsule. And between the posterior, posterior capsule and the disc, there is cloacal canal. And around the disc, we have area of martigiani in the vitreous cavity. Although vitreous looks clear, but there are structures there. And there are cisternal systems. So it's not just one jelly there like jello. The most significant and most adherent part of the vitreous is attached to the vitreous base. There are lots of fibers in the vitreous base, and vitreous base straddles the ora serrata, about one to two millimeter anterior to the ora serrata, and one to two millimeter posterior to the ora serrata in that area that arrow shows. When we look at the posterior vitreous, again, there are structures there. To the left, there is a hole that's where the attachment to the disc is. And that central roundish ovalish thing that you see, that is the attachment to the macular area. The, in the posteriorly, the most significant attachment is to the disc and then to the fovea and vessels. When we look at the posterior vitreous cortex, there are structures. There are fibers in this beautifully imaged OCT that you can see posterior vitreous is not just the jello. And on electron microscopy, a lot of fibers can be seen at vitroretinal interface. During the embryonic period, there are vessels that come from the optic nerve anteriorly toward the disc. And as they move anteriorly toward the disc, they feed the lens during embryonic period. The, as the baby develops, and after birth, we don't see those blood vessels. If they persist, those blood vessels, we call it persistent fetal vasculature, or previously named PHBV posterior, uh, <clears throat> PHBV persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous. This is the area that primary vitreous was. Around it is secondary vitreous, and then tertiary vitreous is the periphery of it. <laughs> In a very young age, on the top image, the vitreous is formed and more consistent in a very young person. As we become adult in the middle images, we see some fibers. And as we get older, then some lacuna forms in the vitreous and vitreous fibers are becoming more prominent. And these lacunas are where sometimes fluids accumulate and we see floaters. So floaters are what we see in the vitreous body as it liquefies, and there, is, there are pockets of fluid called lacunae. Walls of lacunae interfere with the photon transmission, and then we see floaters as the eye moves. Example of those lacunae are seen with those blue arrows in the vitreous of an older person. Posterior vitreous detachment is separation of the posterior vitreous cortex from the internal limiting membrane of the retina. And usually, that's a, complete, that's a clear separation. But if part of that posterior vitreous cortex stays on the retina, it may have some proliferation and generate epiretinal membrane. Weiss ring is notable in some patients as can be seen here next to the disc. And white string is remnant of vitropapillary attachment and peripapillary glial tissue. We do not know the true incidence and prevalence of PVD. Why? 
because it's difficult to study. There is not one reliable test that we can say this person definitely has PVD or does not have PVD or is there a partial PVD. There are ways to detect it, but they are not like this, not very clear cut. In post-mortem study, about two-thirds of people have PVD in the eighth decade of life, and PVD typically appears at between the ages of 45 and 65. Risk factor is increasing age. As we get older, we get more PVD and floaters. So floaters is a disease of maturity and wisdom. Earlier PVD can happen in myopic people and with some disorders, for example, Marfan's and Stickler syndrome. Symptoms, you all know, there, is flat, there, are, there, is, there are flashes of light, which may be more noticeable in the dark, and floaters that bothers a lot of people in middle age and later in life. In clinical exam, the most important thing is to rule out other pathology because we examine to make sure that there is no retinal tear or retinal break that needs treatment. A slit down by microscopy is helpful. If we see blood in a slit down by microscopy or pigmented cells, that's an indicator that the, in, the risk of retinal tear is higher and we need to be more careful in examining peripheral retina. And the gold standard of examination is indirect ophthalmoscopy and scar depression. The try is to see aura serrata 360 degree and making sure that there is no tear. Sometimes that indirect ophthalmoscopy and 360 degree scar depression is difficult and we can use contact lenses, for example, the three mirror contact lens to see aura serrata better. Unfortunately, there is no single symptom, nor not a combination of symptoms that can, that can reliably differentiate PVD from retinal break. So when the patient calls, there's no symptom that on the phone we can answer and say, oh, there is no retinal break. We need to see them. Also, there is dynamic exam with the eye movement. For example, when we are on the still lamp, with eye movement, we can see the synergies and debris and movement of floaters. With the scar depression, we can actually dynamically move the depression, and sometimes the retinal tears are difficult to see unless we move the scar depression to the right and left or to the posterior and anterior. And also, dynamic exam is helpful when we do ultrasound B scan, because that way we can see the floaters are moving and if the vitreous is completely separated or not. When we have posterior vitreous detachment and vitreous hemorrhage, then the risk of retinal tear significantly increases. When there is vitreous hemorrhage and PVD, two-thirds of patients have retinal break, and they needed to be detected. Now, the problem is when we have vitreous hemorrhage, examination is more difficult. And when there is break, most of them, about 88% of them, are in the superior quadrants. Example of examination of vitreous, the arrows shows pigmented spots that are a sign of a retinal break. Or with the still lamp and oblique view may see the vitreous opacity behind the lens, and with the eye movement we see those movements. In dilated exam, sometimes we see a ring or an oval semi-transparent <clears throat> finding, which is the Y string, that's where the, the vitreous was attached to the optic disc. Although we call it Y string, but the complete ring is not that common. About a quarter to two-thirds of the Y strings are actually a complete ring. More commonly, they are partial ring, and sometimes there is ball-like opacity, hole without a ring, or insect-like. This is an example of white ring here. As you can see, as we focus on the white ring, the retina is not in focus because they are in different plane. So when we are examining with the still lamp, we focus on the disc, then we pull the lever toward ourselves so that we focus in the vitreous, and then we, sign the, we find the floater. Another example of white string here next to the optic nerve. This is a partial ring, which looks like a curve, and that's the more common finding. 
It could be insect-like or like a fly. It could be linear or it could be like a dot and oval finding in the vitreous cavity. And one thing is when the eye moves, we see the movement of those, so it's a floater. OCT is capable of image imaging floaters and PVDs, especially if they are close to the retina. If they are way anterior, that's more, much more difficult to image with OCT. This is an example of partial PVD that was imaged with OCT. Here is the posterior vitreous, which is separated in the paraphobial space, but is attached in the center. That's a PVD here, an attachment in center, so it's, there is vitreophobial adhesion, but separation from the rest of the macula. Ultrasound is helpful. We see the opacities, and as the eye move right and left or up and down, we can see that those floaters are moving around. Another example of ultrasound, you see a ring. That's a voice ring. In a, in a magnified view, you see the ring. And this one here, that's just to make the ring more significant and more beautiful. beautiful. There is a diamond on the ring. Also, when we do ultrasound, we may see the posterior hyaloid face, as you can see here, and there is an oval white ring inside that. Let's look at stages of PVD. Stage zero, which is no PVD, when we have fully attached vitreous, like in a young person, the arrow shows that the vitreous is attached to the retina. And here is the fovea. Stage one is separation of perifoveal vitreous, but in the center of the fovea, we have attachment. Here is the fovea. There is attachment, and vitreous is separated in the two sides on a BS scan. In a montage, you see, again, separation around the fovea, attachment on the fovea, and on the disc. And on OCT, attachment on the fovea, and separation in the other area, so this is a stage one. A stage two is complete separation of the vitreous from the macula, but still there is attachment in the other areas. So here is, sorry, here is the fovea and separation of the vitreous, as you can see on this montage. A stage three is widespread vitreous separation except at the optic disc margin. Here is the optic nerve, attachment here, and that posterior vitreous separation. Sometimes the BS scan in this case is misleading because as the eye moves, then we see this area is already separated. So this needs to a dynamic test and asking the patient to look in different direction to see if this is still attached or not and a montage of stage three. A stage four is complete clinically recognizable PVD, so everything is separated except at ora serrata. So this is the posterior hyaloid phase and PVD, and complete separation from the retina. This is a little bit modified version of that staging, and if we look at the images together, this is a stage one with attachment in the fovea and separation in the other areas, and a stage three, which is separation in most of the areas, but it's still out to the disc, and a stage four, which total separation has happened. Let's quickly look at management of posterior vitreous detachment. So symptoms usually decrease and diminish over time. That's why the most commonly used management is close observation and watching the patient. However, patients are bothered by it and complain a lot. There is significant reduction in contrast sensitivity, and in one study, patients were willing to accept 7% risk of loss of vision, blindness, to get rid of floaters. 
Now, when we have acute PVD symptoms, there is 8 to 26 percent risk of retinal tear that needs treatment, and that will be discussed by my colleagues. Now, if we have a PVD and we don't find a break on our exam, still there is 2 percent chance of developing retinal break in future visits. Vitrectomy is a treatment for floaters. If there is significant floater, it can improve the visual acuity. It can improve the contrast sensitivity. Why it improves the contrast sensitivity? Because when we remove the vitreous, especially when there are lots of floaters, the echo density is reduced by 94%. And when the things go well, there is a good patient satisfaction. However, there are risk of complications like vitreous hemorrhage, retinal detachment, retinal tear, cataract surgery, which makes us think twice before we want to do vitrectomy, or three times. YAG laser has been proposed, and in some case reports and case studies, it has been shown that it can improve the symptoms. It's not as definite as vitrectomy in improving the symptom, but it can improve. There are a number of studies on vitrectomy and YAG laser. However, the jury is out. There is not enough of high-level evidence to support these treatments at this time. So in conclusion, symptomatic floaters can be very bothersome for patients, and patients with acute PVD should have a good evaluation, 360-degree evaluation of oral serotonin and peripheral retinal to rule out retinal breaks. And management option are observation, which is the most commonly done, and then possibly vitrectomy, YAG laser, and even pharmacotherapy. But the evidence for those interventions are not conclusive at this time, and uh, we need much more evidence before we can actually have any recommendation about them. So the main, the main state of treatment at this time is observation. Regarding preventing PVD, there is no effective method to prevent PVD at this time. And patients who have acute PVD and no retinal break, still they may develop a retinal break about 2% of time, so they need follow-up. How we follow this patient? If there is symptomatic PVD but there is no break, we follow up them in 1 to 8 weeks and then 6 to 12 months. If there is symptomatic PVD without break, but there is some retinal hemorrhage, which means that there have been some adhesion. We follow them in one to two weeks, double check to make sure there is no retinal break. Now, if there is symptomatic PVD without break, but we have vitreous hemorrhage, we follow up weekly until the hemorrhage resolved and we can have a little bit more confidence that there is no break. Thank you very much.